Hello and welcome everyone to our next Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, et cetera, live event. We're talking welcome about everyone to our next month. Facebook, and, YouTube. You know, starting the conversation and talking about suicide. I am your host, Dr. James Simmons. I'm a nurse practitioner, uh, founder of Ask the NP. And I'm joined by uh, several folks you can see on your screen here right now. Professional MMA fighter, mom, and businesswoman, Kat Zingano. Wave hi, Kat. There you go. Oregon Medical Director at Providence, Dr. Paul Geiger. And Executive Director at the Defensive Line, Ray Horst. Thank you all three for being here. Really, really appreciate your time. And I'm going to give each of you a chance to sort of introduce yourselves. And we're going to talk a little bit more about your stories and suicide awareness in general. But before we go any further, we're talking about suicide, right? This is a really tough one. So a couple of things we got to get out of the way first, all right? As a general disclaimer for all the Facebook Lives that we do here at Providence, the, this video is not, it is only for informational purposes <laughs> and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, always please seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. And as well, you know, the topic being suicide awareness and suicide awareness day just happened at suicide awareness week. We really want to let everyone know that this conversation may be triggering for a lot of people. There, there might be some topics and some things that we talk about here that are uh, tough and maybe too tough to listen to. And so if you need to tune out, that's okay. If you need to grab your coworker or your dog or your spouse, if you're home or whoever, um, and say, I just listened to a really tough conversation, please do that. Uh, we'll give, we'll share some resources later on in the talk, but as well, please know that 1-800-273-TALK um, is always a resource available for you if you are feeling like harming yourself or know someone who is. Also, in many areas of the United States, not everywhere yet, but many areas, 988 is also an emergency mental health line for lots of folks. So with those aside, um, let's talk about suicide and, and starting the conversation. Sometimes it's hard to just say that, right? It's, sometimes it's hard to just say, we need to talk about suicide and we need to talk about the realities of it. And so I, I wanna give our guests here an opportunity to introduce themselves quickly and, and share their stories so we can really get into the conversation. And Kat, I'm gonna pick on you first, if you can introduce yourself to everyone and um, sort of let them know your relationship and why you're so passionate about suicide awareness. So I'm Kat Zingano, and um, I am currently ranked uh, number two in the world at 145 pounds. I'm going to fight for the title later this year. Um, I've been ranked in the top five for the last 12 years, I think, um, in MMA and have, uh, you know, just really had it be something uh, major for me in my life as, as a coping skill, as something that I use as an outlet, you know, but working hard at these types of things, you know, it achieved me these other things. And so I'm, uh, I'm in the sport doing what I'm doing. And I feel very grateful that I have these things because yes, I, I do come from uh, situations and, um, you know, a relationship with uh, suicide in my life. Um, my first relationship with suicide was my mom's sister. Uh, she passed away when, right before I was born, I didn't, you know, know her. Uh, I'm actually named after her. My middle name is Deborah, and her name was Deborah. But, you know, something I saw with that my whole life was just, you know, my mom was always sad. She was always missing her sister. I mean, she carried on. She did a, a really good job with us kids, um, wanting us to remember her sister or think of her sister in some really positive ways. But there was always, you know, a sadness and a darkness to their family because, um, you know, she had uh postpartum depression issues that mm. you know she she didn't get through and uh and she passed away um she committed suicide uh having two younger children um mm. little kids um later in my life back in 2014 uh my husband who was also my coach and you know he's the father to our little boy brayden who was seven at the time um he also decided to take his life he was you know, going through a lot of stuff mentally and physically and, um, you know, had substance issues going on and things that, uh, he, again, he, you know, he didn't 
figure it out. He didn't, he didn't get through that fight. And, um, you know, 2014, I think it was right. Basically the peak of our career together. You know, he was my coach. I got mm -hmm. there with him and I was fighting for the belt in the UFC and, um, you know, I, I hurt my knee and I lost the title shot and all of that. And, um, you know, he got super depressed and all of these things caught up with him. And, uh, you know, he ended up taking his life in January of 2014. Mm. Wow. And, God, that's, yeah. that's, this is the second time now that I, I've heard your story live and it's, it's, it's so difficult to hear. I, I can't imagine sharing it, um, you know, repeatedly, but I, we're so glad that you do and that you are talking about your, the situation with your husband and with other family members in order to bring, you know, awareness um, to suicide and, and help open up that conversation. Thank you so much for sharing that. I okay. truly appreciate it. We're, we're going to come back to you. We're going to have a lot more <laughs> to talk about this. Um, I want to give Ray popped back in here. Hopefully we've worked out our technical is uh, Ray Horse. I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, James. And Kat, thank you for sharing your story. I've never heard your story before. Um, so I'm really, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit more about your life. Um, but I'm Ray, I'm executive director for the Defensive Line. Um, and we founded our nonprofit out of the loss of my cousin, Ella, to suicide. Um, and I started this with my aunt and uncle and my cousin, Solomon. Um, and Ella was just a brilliant young woman um, who struggled greatly and and um, ended up dying by suicide on uh, January 23rd of 2018. And her parents and cousin, my cousin Solomon were really struggling to find a way to do something with that. I mean, and there's no obligation to do something with that, but there are these really forceful people with uh, so much passion and so much love and it just, felt like there was this opportunity to turn their, that into something purposeful. And so we've been talking for a few years and decided to form the defensive line and share their story because we think that the, the story of the lived experience is sorely missing from the conversation of suicide as much as we talk about this um, and we understand research and we theorize about it. We need more people who are speaking from the experience, the perspective of losing a loved one to suicide or struggling with suicide themselves. And um, we want to elevate that into the conversation. So we have a storytelling program where we share the story of our co-founders and we're building a speakers bureau of people like you, Kat, who have a really compelling story to share. Um, and then we also have a suicide prevention workshop program, which we're very, very proud of. We work with the leaders of young people in schools to talk about how they can be better suicide prevention interveners, advocates, have more crisis-based conversations and connect young people to the resources that exist already within their school to support their mental health. So I'm just very excited to be here with you all today and, and talk more about this work and, and how we can uh, keep moving forward in suicide prevention. And uh, I think prevention, it, sharing those stories of the lived experience, Ray, you're, you're onto something that people don't I think often relate to prevention or relate to the stories of suicide in general. And so I'm really, really anxious for our audience and myself and everyone to hear more about how you and the defensive line are doing that. Um, that's, that's exciting work. So thank you very much for that. Dr. Geiger, I want to give you a chance to say hello to everyone and let us know um, what your role is at Providence and your relationship to this really important topic before we get going. Great. Thanks, James. Yeah. My name is uh, Paul Geiger and uh, I'm a, I'm a, practicing psychiatrist, and I became uh, interested in this uh, topic uh, because throughout my now nearly 20-year career working in a, as a hospital-based psychiatrist, I frequently worked with uh, you know folks that were suicidal, struggling with suicide. I've lost many patients to suicide. Um, and you know, over the years, uh, became aware of, uh, you know, uh, you know, scientific, uh, 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 research and best practices that we knew were out there that weren't necessarily being implemented nationwide or, or throughout our system. Um, and uh, I had a leadership role at Providence within the mental health uh, division in Oregon. Uh, I'm currently at the health plan um, and oversee our, our zero suicide uh, uh, quality improvement focus group for the system. 
Uh, and really, our, 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 our hope is to, you know, how do we improve, um, you know, what I refer to as, as uh, suicide care, um, it's kind of an odd term, but, but if you think about it, you know, how do we approach the problem clinically based on, on best practice and the evidence? And with the really focus on areas where we know patients are interacting frequently, like in primary care, in the ER, in medical hospitals, and how do we expand the knowledge of kind of the general medical workforce uh, uh, to be able to you know, recognize risk and intervene in an effective way um, so that we can prevent that outcome. So that's um, mm -hmm. kind of my uh, background, how I got interested in it and, and what, we're, what we're doing about it now. Um, we really think that there's a lot uh, to do in this space, uh, and there's a lot of evidence for things that we can proactively do to help prevent, uh, prevent this outcome. And I think in, in pre preventing the outcome of suicide, there's we've got some sort of, you know, I, I think corporate speak, I'm not a corporate guy, but I think corporate speak is synergies here between what you're talking about, Dr. Geiger, sort of in the multiple different clinical environments, which is something that, you know, as a, as a practicing hospitalist, we also really focus on that there are many times where we interact with patients and family members who may be at high risk for suicide. And we're not necessarily trained to identify that or really know what to do with it in what is otherwise sort of a, a medical situation, right? So someone's there for sepsis or in the ICU or sort of hip surgery or whatever, right? But as we sort of build in recognizing uh, mental health and particularly suicidality into those as practitioners, we can better identify it and prevent it just like in all situations of our life, right? So if we're talking about suicide, it's easier to then talk about suicide when you are having coffee with a girlfriend, right? Or you're in a relationship with someone or, you know, whatever that situation is. And, and Kat, I'd love to hear from you sort of just in general, like why is it important to you and for others to just talk about mental health and suicide in, in general? Well, I mean, I think we all go through it and, you know, I don't, I, I think everyone in their lives has the ups and downs, you know, nothing always stays good forever. Like there's, there's different types of losses and, and there's different types of emotions that come with um, these types of feelings. And, um, and I, I think mental illness or just even mental mind states are, are something that are different per person. And my reaction to something doesn't necessarily mean the person next to me that their reaction is going to be the same to us going through the same thing and and just being able to be unique in how we're feeling and safe and talking about how we're feeling without feeling shamed or without feeling like we're wrong or without feeling like um you know we're weak uh that there's ways that you can reach out and you can talk to people and you can get through things um through just needing a little help or needing some understanding or you know sometimes even realizing like what does the impact of what I'm thinking of doing do to not only me, but my loved ones? Um, what, you know, are options of things that I can do to feel better? And where can I find those? You know, all, all of the, the ways that um, people need to know that they can get through it, uh, mm -hmm. especially for those left behind, especially for, you know, them to just know and feel that they can get better, that things do get better, and that there are resources to that. Absolutely. And I, I, by the way, this is for Ray and Dr. Geiger and everyone watching and listening. This is definitely a conversation. So I think I officially have my host hat on. Um, but please do not necessarily wait for me to ask questions or interject. Like, um, you know, we have three experts here and I am by no means an, an expert. And so I just want to sort of facilitate our conversation, but really also be able to provide resources and answers to folks who are watching. Um, so you mentioned resources that are out there, including ways of thinking differently about one situation when they're, when a person is maybe so close to suicide, what Ray, Dr. Geiger, either of you, what, what are those resources? Like, let's just get to it. Well, I think one thing Kat touched on that I think just to go back to the question you asked of her, that is such a big part of a resource is getting rid of the shame around suicide and suicide ideation and mental health and mental illness and, that comes with starting a conversation and being able to normalize the language and the words that we that are even part of this conversation. I think, you know, one thing you experience when some when your loved one dies by suicide is just how afraid people are 
to talk about how they died um, and just walk around you with tiptoes. And um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, so many of us do have these thoughts. I've, I've experienced suicide thoughts and I know that that is, you kind of get overwhelmed with shame. And so when you have a resource like the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, um, or, I mean, I'm an advocate for speakers bureaus of people with lived experience where the resource is to hear other people's stories. I think that is such a huge value add to anybody who might be experiencing these struggles because they can hear the human experience voice back to them. You can kind of add a face to the name of what you're hearing and the language that you're hearing throughout. So um, I'm really an advocate for organizations that elevate stories like this and like Providence and having conversations like this today. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great point, Ray. I think that that's, you know, in a way, uh, perhaps the key issue is, is, you know, there's a lot of stigma and bias around mental health in, in, in folks just I think historically have felt, you know, nervous or, you know, sh shamed perhaps um, uh, reaching out for help. And I think that's a key element, you know, of our work is to really, you know, how do we take those barriers down so people don't feel like there's a stigma in asking for help? Um, you know, you can't, can't step in and assist somebody if you don't know they're there, right? And so, and how are you going to know? Um, you know, that's part of our education uh, uh, approach, even with families. I mean, sometimes people are nervous. Um, you know, if I ask about it, am I going to plant the idea in somebody's mm -hmm. head? And, and there's a fair amount of research that shows that it's probably, that's not the case. You know, that if you are worried about somebody, uh, it's okay to ask. You're not going to give them, you know, an idea that, that you know, they haven't thought of before. Um, and, and, and you can only be a help. So I think that's a key issue, you know, uh, working with education, that it's normal and okay to ask for help. Uh, and by sending that message about what the avenues are, what the helplines are, what the resources are, um, constantly sending that message, I think, um, sends a secondary message, which is it's completely okay. It's okay to get treated for diabetes. It's okay to get treated for asthma. And if you're stressed out, you're having panic attacks, you're depressed, or you're suicidal, it's okay to ask for help. It's the same thing. Mm. You, you mentioned asthma, and we are pretty trained, even if we're not trained, to know that someone's having a hard time breathing, <laughs> right? I can hear this person wheezing. Uh, they're not breathing very well. I should maybe do something about this. I should call 911 or like ask someone around me for help or something. We're not as trained on some of those mental health uh, signs. What What are some, and this is for all three of you, whoever wants to jump in, what are what are some signs that we can say, okay, help, or even ask that question, right? Uh, I, I, I have said in the past, and this is a little bit controversial and maybe a little aggressive, but it's better to have a pissed off friend than a dead one. Asking someone and sometimes being intentional about it, are you planning on hurting yourself? Is Because I do have some training, but some folks who don't have training about how to get to that place and ask that question, like what are people looking for in their loved ones when they might be suicidal? Yeah, maybe I'll just uh, jump into that. I, I think, you know, no one's got a crystal ball and there's probably no perfect way to do this. And I think the best place to start is, you know, if you have somebody who you have a relationship with, um, often you'll have a spidey sense around something seems off. And I think it's completely okay to just start. It's probably best to just start with being very super general. Like, um, how are you doing? I'm, I'm a little worried. This, you don't seem like yourself. Um, and, you know, you could share what you're observing. And, and that's probably a good a good start. And then, kind of depending on where that conversation goes, um, you can direct people to, to to resources. But I think that that's just the the you know you open the door, right? I've noticed. I care. I'm concerned. Share with me. And then I think you you, you take it from there. Yeah, I love that because that's that's what I would have jumped in on. I think the number one thing I would say is noticing a change in behavior and trusting your gut and your relationship with that person, because there are so many warning signs, but they're not consistent with every person, you know, and they don't show up consistently in every person who attempts suicide. So I think, um, you know, and at the defensive line in our workshop, we go through an acronym called our D lines and it's don't ignore your gut, listen for the signs, interact, name your concern, evidence your concern, and create a supportive environment. And it's all about 
that gut interaction and, and having those conversations and building trust with somebody and coming back and asking again and noticing. And I just uh, completely echo that. And I think it's the perfect way to approach it. Yeah, I, I do think it it is a complicated thing to see sometimes. Sometimes people are the life of the party, but you know, when they go home, it's very different once they're alone. And you know, some people they like like their space. They like to be alone and they, they you know, they'll come back around when they're feeling better. Some people when they need space it it's not a good thing and, and you don't know if you should be checking on them. You don't know if you should you know if they're pushing you away, are you supposed to fight back? Are you gonna let them? Like it's it's a very, very complicated thing. And I think um but I do think there is a vibe to it. I do think there is something that you like you said that you can sense is off. Um, you know, people go through things and, and sometimes you don't know if that's the one that just you know, they're over it, they're done, you know, they don't want to be here. And I think there's a look, you know, there's a bit of a look in their eye, a little bit of a energy that they have. And, you know, I think those are the moments when it's safe to say like, hey, where's your head at these days? Like, how are you doing with this thing that you've been going through? Or like, I know this type of thing from before in your life has been, you know, on your mind a lot at times, like, how, how are you with that? Where, where, you know, where do you stand with all that? Are you good? Like, do you need anything? Do you, do you, like, are you all right? And let them see that you're ready to meet them wherever they're at so they can, they can let it out and they can talk to you. And then you guys can talk about what you can do to help them not feel alone or help them feel like we will get through this or it's going to be okay. Or, or those types of things where it takes away the pressure of the aloneness and the shame of even having that thought or those feelings, you know, that's, it's big. It, it is big. And that's, there's sort of a, I think a, a, a tough realization for, from those of us maybe trying to help someone who might be in, in a situation where they're feeling suicidal and that, okay, what do we do after that? Like we've op sort of opened the door, uh, we've opened the door and, and this person is saying, yes, I'm in a really rough place. And then it's like, Oh God, what do we do then? So what do we do then? <laughs> when someone said, yeah, I'm feeling like harming myself. I'm not in a good place. And thank you for being receptive to listening to me. But then what, what are the next steps after that for those of us trying to help? I think checking in a lot and um, you know, just, seeing where they're at, make, asking them about their day, asking them what went good. You know, um, I, I, I don't think telling people the negative things about themselves helps because they're already feeling terrible. So to be like, hey, you know, if you do this, you're gonna hurt A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Like, I think those things just make everything worse. I think to know you're loved and to have it feel like this, hey, I love you. And it's just a given that like, if you're not here, I'm not going to be okay, you know, because I love you, but not throwing that in their face and then helping, maybe looking like, do you want me to help you look for someone to talk to? Do you want me to go with you? Can I drive you there? Um, like, do you need me to come to your house and get rid of your bottles? Or like, can I take your kids for a minute and like, give you a break? Like, what do you, what do you need? And then if they don't know what they need, then you start helping. Like you just start, I don't know, let's try this. Let's try that. And, you know, maybe start throwing some things at them and, and see if any of it is attractive. And then, you know, try to provide some way of getting there, or some way of walking in that direction. Yeah, I love that. Like, it's what kind of support do you need? Why? What, I don't need to bring in all of my solutions for you necessarily. You can tell me what kind of help you really need in this moment. And also, like, don't try to fix it. For them you know like your job is not there to make them not sad anymore like you're there to hold space with them and and give them room to feel whatever they're feeling and like kat said continue to come back and continue to give them that room and check on them you know i think that's all really important part of staying there with them and and give yourself ample time if you start a conversation with somebody around this and, and they open up to you, make sure you have the time to stay there in that conversation. Don't just run off five minutes later to run to your next appointment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of kind of like this conversation we're having, unfortunately. We, we don't have too, too much longer. I realize we're already 25 minutes in. Um, 
So thank you uh, for sharing that. The, we have had a couple of questions come in already on, on LinkedIn um, that in our, our few minutes here we have left, I, I wanna see if all three of you can help us answer. Um, we, we started to get to it in this, actually we were just started to get to this one. Can you please address how to provide support without minimizing the issues that the affected person is facing? And I think sometimes that's, it's, it's hard for us to not do that, right? I'm such a solution person, right? So it was really great for you to hear, like, don't try to fix this <laughs> for them, right? Like I want to come in and like, like a wrecking ball and be like, let me just fix it all for you. I also sometimes will be like, oh, it's just a cat, like your cat died or whatever's going on, right? And like, we should all not try to minimize that. How do we do that? How do we not be the jerk who, you know, minimizes what's going on? I think it's fair to ask what kind of support they need where it's like, hey, do you want me to listen? Or do you want me to help you think? Like, do you want me to say things like, do you want solutions? Or is it more useful for me to just hear you right now? And, you know, give them the the space to tell you what they need you know mm -hmm. and um and if they don't have anything and you're like is it all right if i offer what i think could be a good idea for you to go do but i don't think having an opinion on what they're going through is fair at all and i think that shouldn't be touched i think that goes like what they're going through needs to be discussed with someone that knows how to do this and like how to help them sort their thoughts and organize what they are going to do about it. I think as a friend and as someone that's trying to approach someone that's going through it, I think, you know, you, you just make sure that they know you're there and that they're being heard and that um, you're in it with them to, to figure out how to get out the other side. Yeah, that's a nice, really nice way to, to phrase that. And I think you know, just approaching it from kind of a neutral, non-judgmental position. You know, if somebody's overwhelmed, they're overwhelmed, and and people get overwhelmed with different kinds of things and uh, different sequences of things. And the important things is not whether it's it, it makes sense or it makes sense to you. It's the fact that this is somebody you know and care about, and they are overwhelmed. And so, just acknowledging that, like, wow, you are really overwhelmed right now. You're really struggling. How can I help? And Kat, you had a perfect script, I think, for that, which is, you know, what can I do? Do you need a ride? Do you need an extra hand? Um, you know, tell me how I can help. And just that moment, I think, provides uh, hope for people. Um, so that would be my approach. I love it. I love it. There's, you know, another question that we have, and this this one is is pretty sensitive. Um, you know, the, the person on LinkedIn is asking, um, I'd, I'd really like to learn how to communicate with the person who may be immediately suicidal. So has a gun, has a very specific plan, um, has another weapon or something that they may be using to harm themselves, medication, something like that. What what are we if as, as lay persons, so if we're not professionals, but we're just a friend or fan, loved one, and someone is immediately suicidal, what are our best actions? Well, I think asking, again, having permission does a lot and asking if you can come and take things away or have them put it down or, you know, move it away. I think if it's immediate, um, I think there's times where you do need to do welfare checks and you might need some support. You might mm -hmm. need to call a mental health uh, worker through a police station or, or through something like that to to come and support you because there there definitely can be moments where it's you know you you've bit off more than you can chew if they're already there you know so um i guess kind of trying to assess like like are you is it like right now or go time and if that's it like bring in the troops you know i think if it's something where they're thinking you know they have pills you know they have guns you know they have stuff but it's you know, not in their hands. It's, you know, maybe not even on the coffee table. It's, you know, away. I think those are things that you can talk through and ask if, hey, for the meanwhile, would you be okay with me taking these things or me putting them in a box and locking it or me doing something that can at least give someone a little bit more time in decision making if they are upset or if they are feeling overwhelmed or, or even say, hey, if you're thinking about this, can you promise you'll give me a call, you know, and we'll, we'll talk or or something and i i work i think that's all really powerful and excellent mm -hmm. i i worked on a, a crisis hotline 
um, for a number of years in homelessness, and we got a lot of calls of people who were experiencing present suicidality. Um, and bringing in the troops is a big part, you know, and I think that's, you know, in some ways um, controversial, um, but I think in a moment of somebody is immediately in danger of harm, you have to do what you have to do. I also think it depends on the situation. If you're sitting with somebody, it's different than if you're on the phone with somebody. Um, sometimes it's about bringing them to the present moment, asking a ton of questions about, you know, what their plan is, going through, trying to kind of get them to talk a lot more and assess the, the situation as much as you can. Buying time a little bit is important. Um, and just asking tons of questions about where they are, what are they looking at, what's around them, try to bring them into the present moment. Um, I think these are all really important things and, and seeing if you can get there, get somebody there as soon as possible, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, um, just try to get them to be not alone immediately um, and then you know see what you can do in the moments following. Yeah, I, I think it's it's important to try to lower the temperature. Another uh, sort of corporate word, if we will, that when someone is in that very very moment, um, to to remind them that they are not alone and that um, they they are loved and that there are other ways to deal with the problems that are going on right now. Um, and we're not minimizing how you're feeling at all whatsoever. Um, but please know that there are also there's help and there are resources and there are other solutions to fixing the problem that right now feels so overwhelming. Um, and I think really sending that message directly to people is really, really important for them to hear that sort of in that moment. Dr. Geiger, I don't know if you also agree. Yeah, I think uh, Ray used the, the phrase buying some time. And I, I think that's a really key point. You know, a lot of folks. Uh, you know, research shows that when people get suicidal, that you know they're not necessarily suicidal for hours and hours and hours. It often comes in these kind of intense bursts of time. You know, 15, 20 minutes of kind of getting there. Um, you get people kind of past that crisis. You know, that kind of hope. Um, and just reminding folks that you know, a lot, most people listening to this are not trained mental health professionals. You're not trained crisis negotiators. You know, so you know, calling in the troops is okay uh, after you've given a brief message of hope and support um, and explaining kind of why. Uh, that's being done. Um, and, you know, for folks listening to this, we've been talking about a lot of intense things. And, and we've mentioned the, you know, the 988 number or the 1-800-834-TALK uh, 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 suicide crisis line uh, for people to, to access if you're having thoughts about suicide today. And I also think, I also think, you know, sometimes buying yourself some time is important if you're experiencing crisis. I think, Getting out of your immediate environment, you know, going for a walk, um, calling the first person you can think to call, calling 988, calling whomever, um, you know, if you feel you don't have somebody to talk to. I think whatever you can do to change your immediate environment is really helpful and important. Um, and then, you know, but I do encourage people to call for crisis help if they are experiencing an immediate crisis. You may not think it's useful, but um, you never know who you're going to meet on the other end of the line who might be able to talk to you. Who can really support you. And sometimes it's just breaking that, right? Sometimes it's just that that intensity and that moment that feels yeah. so overwhelming. Uh, someone can really just break that, and maybe it is a uh, someone who actually isn't in your world but is sort of trained to help you in that moment, Ray, like you said. So thank you for that. And Dr. Geiger as well. I just want to remind folks watching um, and everyone, uh, 988, so like 911, but 988 uh, works in a good chunk of the country. Give it a whirl, try it out. If not, 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. That number still works as well. Um, we have just a, literally about 60 seconds or so. I just want to give each of you an opportunity um, to, I want to say thank you for coming on and sharing, albeit briefly, sharing your, your stories and your resources and your perspective about this. And I would love to start with you, Dr. Geiger, just sort of one last thing, like you have, you have everyone's attention, one last thing that you want everyone to know in terms of a takeaway regarding suicide awareness and suicide prevention. I just reemphasize the importance of, of, you know, doing what you can to lower stigma, and help people around you realize it's okay to ask for help. That's the biggest thing. People who are in that headspace uh, need support and they can benefit from the help available. So 
to, to what you can do to get people connected. That would be the, that would the key. Awesome. Ray, any, any last thoughts? You know, my, my aunt Martha always says that suicide prevention is about hope. And I think it's one of the most powerful things I've held on to um, since we started this, because it's not what you would immediately think of when you think of suicide prevention, but if you're here and you can talk about this and there are opportunities to talk to other people um, and there's a chance to have a conversation, there's hopefulness there, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that needs to be leaned into a little bit more. There's opportunity. Your life is an opportunity. There's hope for tomorrow. And there's always an opportunity for something to change and um, things can get better. So I, I really believe in that. I think that is such an important part of talking about suicide. Absolutely. Hope there, there is, even if the hope, it, it feels like tomorrow is too far away. There's hope and there's opportunity in the next moment, yeah. in the next 10 seconds. Um, so break, break whatever overwhelming cycle you're in, uh, in whatever ways you can go pet the dog or go pee or take a walk or make an omelet or whatever you need to do and know that, the, that there is hope in the next 10 seconds. There's hope in the next hour. Um, so thank you for that, Ray. I really, I really appreciate that. Kat, any, any sort of, uh, thoughts around your experience and suicide prevention and suicide awareness as we wrap up here? Um, you know, just. I just really want people to know and understand like you can get through it and like like we can get through it. I there's a moment later in your life where you're going to look back at this time and you're going to be like god I remember how hard that was. I remember how bad I was feeling and like I'm so glad I didn't do that. Like I'm here mm -hmm. and you know maybe that's the catalyst like that made you make some changes or take inventory of the people and the energies in your life or what can you do differently what are you sick of more than being here and see what you can do to change that like what can you talk about to get off of your chest and what will life be like after you've addressed that and mm -hmm. like look forward to the day that you get to turn around and look back and be like man that was hard like wow i only remember that i don't live there anymore mm -hmm. and having that memory and having that memory be awesome and, and that can be you and that can happen. And it's very, very real. Mm. That's awesome, Kat. Thank you very much for sharing that. And, and Ray Horst and Dr. Geiger, both of you, thank you so much for being here. We really, truly appreciate it. Um, I just want to reiterate one last time, 988 in most parts of the country, if you need help or if you need help helping someone, it's also a resource for you. If that's not working where you are, 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255 is still working. You can call that number as well. They also have text lines, by the way. So if you have access to the internet and you can get on real quick, you prefer texting someone, you can do that as well. Um, thank you again for Providence for giving us the space and the opportunity to have this conversation. I think we have uh, an opportunity to really help people with this. So, you know, we've started this conversation addressing suicide in the US and and globally, and please continue to spread awareness about this um, and be that conduit, be that help for people that you know and love around you. Um, also, if you are looking for medical or psychiatric advice, of course, not immediate in the long term, please visit, of course, providence.org and follow Providence on social at Providence on Twitter and Facebook and under Providence Health System on Instagram and LinkedIn. Again, 988 if you need help. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you for being patient with us going over. We really appreciate it. Take mm -hmm. care.